All right, everybody, welcome to the Creative Cup podcast. This is a show with everyday creatives, conversation over a cup of coffee. And today's guest is Mandy Cochran. She's a self-proclaimed golden girl, wrestling super fan, sloth enthusiast, nap guru, and I'm gonna add in the most in touch, involved, and innovative creative director in the business. Thanks. <laughs> Mandy, uh, what's your current title? And give me like a brief summary of what it took to get there. Sure, so my current title is creative director and designer uh, at a uh, full service marketing agency called Market Wake. Uh, we're over in Brookhaven, it's about a 25 person shop. We do a little bit of everything. It is the job closest to art school experience I think I've ever had where I've had to do things I haven't done in a decade where you're like, hey, do you remember how to prototype an adhesive label? And you're like, I haven't done that in a decade. Yeah, I think I can do that. I so it's, it, it is nonstop, but nonstop fun. So um, love that. I recently came from uh, Dagger, which is where we met. I was creative director there, helped build the most magnificent team of creative people I have ever seen, ever worked with. Everybody is a huge success and um, loving watching all of their success from afar. And then before that, uh, went client side for a little bit with Salesforce. That was about two years, two and a half years where just really learning a lot about marketing. Uh, found out it was not really the right fit for me, but I invaluable, the, the things that I learned about how marketing works, about how sales work, um, and then having so many B2B clients now, it's just, I, I feel like I have such a, a leg up on people mm -hmm. just from getting that super boring corporate experience. And then before that, my first job was um, Engage, which is the agency that sold to Moxie. So lots of Moxie people came from Engage and then lots of Engage alum also, of course, went and founded Dagger. So kind of came full circle a little bit and now I'm, I'm off the circle and into new, into new territory with Market Wake. Amazing. Yeah, you mentioned Dagger, which is where we overlapped. We worked together for about a year there. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't directly on your team, but I did have the pleasure of watching you lead that creative team you mentioned, which everyone was incredibly talented, still is incredibly talented, and I, like you said, it's been a pleasure to watch everyone thrive where they are now. Um, but that team and the time we worked there together just so adored and appreciated you as a leader, and that's something that you don't often see in this agency world, it's pretty cutthroat and it's, there's not a lot of human to human love like I saw in that building. Right. How did you, how would you describe that creative leadership style that you had there? Um, my main management philosophy is manage the way you want to be managed. Um, I grew up in a house that had a lot of um, emergency support. Um, my mom was a single mom, worked a teacher's salary, so she was often dedicated in other places to where the, the love and support and everything came, you know, as much as it could, but the everyday sort of holding hands through difficulties, it was very much a figure it out kind of environment, which made me very, very self-sufficient. Um, but I learned very early, figure it out, figure it out, figure it out. And I have learned that the way that I like to be managed is a little bit more close quarters where um, I've spent a lot of time in my life taking risks and figuring things out. Having somebody always there who's that sort of bigger bear that can take care of things if something happens is, is the way that I was raised, it's the way I love to be managed, and so it's the way that I manage. I tend to do my best to stay out of people's way, but there is no bigger advocate, no bigger bodyguard, and no bigger fan than me as a manager. And I think that that's what I want. And thankfully I found that it's what most people want as well. Some people need a little bit more micromanagement. Some people want a little bit more or less personal leadership. So um, I'm a deep, almost to a fault empath where the first thing I'm gonna find out about somebody who is, is working for me and working with me, how do you like to be managed? And I, I found that that style of um, making sure that people have what they need can be very versatile because some people don't need as much, but if you're just willing to listen to what people need, put them where they're strongest is my second management mm. philosophy. Stop holding people to their weaknesses and accentuate their strengths, the basis of the strengths finder test. Um, I just, I really like to empower people in the way that works best for them. And I find that if you stay out of their way and are there to catch them, people tend to be at their best. I love that. You keep a blog on your website where you write about a lot of this, where you talk about your management style and a few blog posts and kind of just share some of the readings that maybe got you there or these philosophies that you have. And you mentioned Dr. Brene Brown quite a bit. She is one of my favorite writers and speakers. And I'll say someone that has shaped 
a lot of the EQ that I have as a young professional. Someone handed me a copy of Daring Greatly in my first or second year as a designer. And I, I really think it changed the way I am with clients, the way I am with coworkers, and the way I am now as a creative leader. Um, how did you get onto Dr. Brown's work, and what has it meant to you both in, as a creative leader and just personally? It's, it's really interesting. So um, I was told in an, an employee review one year that, um, you know, you're doing great and we love your work, but we found that sometimes you get inside your own head so much. and. Um, you know, I was I was having issues communicating with people who were giving me bad feedback and and really not facilitating that creative conversation past the point it got uncomfortable. So um, someone mentioned to me, you know, I feel like you need more vulnerability. You need more vulnerability. And again, growing up in this sort of figure it out environment, you know, vulnerability equals weakness. That's mm -hmm. something that Dr. Brown always prefaces. Of everybody thinks that because that's how we're raised. And so really took a deep dive on the word vulnerability, which is perfect, that's the perfect gateway into her work because that's the key word of everything. But um, I read, I thought it was just me, but it isn't, which is actually her first and also her shortest book. So I was like, I guess I'll start there. Um, just reading about, I was actually about to go to therapy for the first time for some personal things that were going on and knew that I would not be effective at opening up if I was waiting on this therapist or this friend or this boss or this client to judge me. So it really was like a snowball rolling downhill where it was right around Halloween because I was just eating all this Halloween candy while listening to it because I was so uncomfortable. I was just eating, mm -hmm. eating, eating, eating. And um, and I finished the first book and, and then I bought all the audiobooks back to back to back to back. And it, it was just, it's the closest thing to a spiritual awakening I think I've ever had where I even, because it has, it, it, it has great length to it. It has so many parables, so many lessons, a really great leader. Um, I do. All, I call her work my scripture. When I when I feel like I'm I'm really falling out of touch with myself or I'm acting outside my values, I'm like you've got to get back in the scripture because it 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 sounds cultish and weird, but it it is the the literary basis of I think what keeps me inside my spiritual self and my core values. And so it was an initial awakening. But I would say that really the the emphasis of her work and the effects of her work have never worn off. And the more and more that I get into it. I, I find the more true I am to myself, the, the happier I am, and really the more gratitude I can practice, mm -hmm. which is something I've always really struggled with because I'm such a completionist and a very hard worker where, you know, what's next, what's next, what's next, doesn't leave a whole lot of room for gratitude. So I, I found it practical back when I was first gonna go to therapy and was ready to change my life and really trying to improve my professional self on these two completely different planes, and now it's a holistic approach to my entire life. and. I love it and I love her work and I'm so glad to see that it's becoming more mainstream and more mm -hmm. popular and um, I can't recommend it enough to everyone. I think there's something that everyone can, can take from Brown's work. I think the TEDx talk is like the big entry point for a lot of people to Definitely. Brene Brown's work. What, um, you mentioned the first book you read of hers mm -hmm. was her first book, but what, what, what would be the first book of hers you would recommend people pick up? I really do love I Thought It Was Just Me. It's, it's really, um, it's called I, I Thought It Was Just Me, but it isn't. Mm -hmm. it, more than anything, it, it is an intro text because it's not as long and then you know she wrote it first. So the thing I love about reading her work chronologically is that you get to grow with her mm -hmm. because she didn't have it all figured out. It's not like a, you know, a Tolkien kind of thing of I have this long story I'm mm -hmm. gonna tell. She's continually doing this qualitative research where she's like, you can kind of hear almost her theories change a little bit as mm -hmm. they go of, you know, I thought I had found the answer about what makes, you know, men so afraid of weakness and what makes you know, what makes the marriage relationship not work. And, and then she's like, oh, I thought I had it figured out four years ago. Here's the new thing that I found. Mm -hmm. And it kind of breaks down that barrier where you don't feel like you're reading somebody's dissertation on right. vulnerability. Mm -hmm. You feel like you are learning alongside her without doing these millions of hours of research and interviews. And um, so I would start with, I thought it was just me, but it isn't. Um, if you, especially if you do it on audiobook, it's not yeah. gonna be long at all, but then you get into really the, the big three. You get into uh, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, Braving the Wilderness. And um, again, it, it will take you along this journey that is tough, yeah. but digestible. Yeah, it's definitely tough, and the tough is there's shame and vulnerability are two of her big focus areas. Um, vulnerability, probably the biggest one that she talks about, and something that I mentioned in your blog, you wrote a blog post 
about how vulnerability can be one of the best tools we have mm -hmm. as a creative. And you identified specifically three parts in the creative process where if we embrace vulnerability, it will work to our favor. And it's hard. I mean, you mentioned it. It leads to binge eating. It leads to <laughs> just shrinking and feelings of uncomfortableness. Yeah. Um, but how, how do we embrace vulnerability as creatives and how does it benefit us? Well, um, I'm probably going to say something different than I wrote in my blog because mm -hmm. I'm scatterbrained. Um, but the way that I've always felt about this, and I actually have written a few blogs for a few different, I wouldn't want to say publications, mm -hmm. but different companies that I've worked for and, and personal blogs and, and guest blogs where three places that I really can see vulnerability stick out as the greatest tool in your creative toolbox is when you're first getting started, you know, everybody talks about the fear of the blank page. and that's really, I think, what prevents people from adopting creativity later in life. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Brown talks about, you know, the creative scars where, you know, we're told in fifth grade or something that we're, we're not an artist. You can't draw, you can't play music, you're not a good singer. And um, if people try to pick it back up in their adulthood because you know, that we all have creative energy and if you don't expel it, it, it festers and it becomes something negative. Mm -hmm. So if that indeed happens, and it does, and then people want to adopt creativity later, they face the blank page and are unwilling to really take that leap and go, I might look stupid, this might be ugly, this might be horrible. So if you can adopt that vulnerability and that willingness to be open and tell your story in the way that you know only you can, just fill the page. And that goes for people who do create creative things day in and day out, and people who don't, where the fear of the blank page is really that fear of looking stupid. And RuPaul Charles says, your fear of, of looking stupid is holding you back. Mm -hmm. So another guru of mine <laughs> um, in many ways. The second opportunity to really be vulnerable is when you're sure you're right, think again. So uh, we, we were iterative. We work through process after process, final, 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 final. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're at that final stage, always dare yourself to, to be kind, but still be your own worst critic. Mm -hmm. Find if this is truly the answer, and if it's not, be willing to take a step back and make it even better. A great example of this is, um, at Market Week, we just launched a CBD oil brand, and we had gotten to final labels, final boxes, ready to go, ready to push, push the button to go live, and realized the logo just wasn't right. It just wasn't right. It, it just was not there. It looked too similar to things in the market. It didn't evoke the feel that we wanted. So we put all of our production on hold for another seven weeks to go back. Hmm make a new logo and go forward again. And I'm so happy with what we came forward with, but that day it was literal blood, sweat and tears of we got so far and now we have to stop, but it's the right thing to do. And mm -hmm. that takes immense vulnerability yeah. to go, you know what, I was wrong. Totally. And, and now I have to start over again and there's that blank page. So it kind of comes full circle there. And then the third stop for, for vulnerability and creativity is opening yourself up to feedback. We are a feedback-based business. You and I listen to what's wrong with our work far more than we listen to what's right about mm -hmm. it. And that takes an immense amount of creative, professional and personal vulnerability where that professional is open yourself up. You've already gone through so much personal feedback and now you have someone else who didn't put in the work and doesn't always understand what it takes telling you what's wrong with it. Dare yourself to be open and listen mm -hmm. to that. And then personally, that vulnerability of knowing what you're worth and not letting what other people say about your work affect that. Yeah. Wow. That's, I, I, you elaborated on the blog post in a way that I think is actually super helpful. Good. So I hope people check out both the blog post and listen to this because um, I know I'm going to take some of that and apply it to my creative process day to day. And you mentioned um, sort of the suppressed creative mm -hmm. that I firmly believe everyone is a creative and has a creative side and the name of the show came from a sentence, how do you fill your creative cup? And I think for me it's not just my 9 to 5 creative Definitely. that fills my cup, of course it does and I'm lucky to work in a creative career the same as you do, but I also do stuff on the side like this show or personal projects and I think for me that helps uh, me familiarize myself with the creative process in a right. way that is more comfortable, where I don't have to maybe be as vulnerable because there's not clients, but I'm vulnerable in a more personal way where I'm putting myself out there. Definitely. Um, so I can't underscore enough the importance of personal projects, even if you are a creative profession professional, but I think a lot of people that are maybe the suppressed creative use these side projects, these little, little things to get themselves out there. Um, as a creative professional, you have your side hobbies and projects. 
Um, I want to hear about some of those, but one that I really want to hear about is the Battery Life Project, which yes. goes up on your blog, and I'll let you explain it because I think the concept is so cool. Great. So um, something that I've always really valued in my career is um, I have great speed, and my speed doesn't necessarily come from cutting corners, even though I do. I use a lot of hotkeys <laughs> and things like that. Um, but I pride myself on making very quick but well-informed decisions. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to concept and create variations very easily and then also further a single concept very easily of left or right, left or right, left or right, and constantly making those decisions quickly. So to enhance that muscle, to sharpen those edges, I have started doing a rebrand website or content piece design project within the battery life of my 2011 MacBook Pro. Wow. So I have about two hours and 49 minutes oh my God. is the battery right. life. So um, I'm, I'm taking things that usually from just an initial, like what's the first thing you think of when you do this? And so I'm splitting it up lately into, uh, I do one blog post a month, so it'll be in May, I rebranded a bakery based on, well, here's one aspect of the brand and I could do it this direction, whereas I normally like to do those two concepts. The next month I did that second concept. Cool. So you still kind of get that well-rounded, you know, which one would you like uh, mm -hmm. that we always have to do for clients. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a lot of fun and it's somewhat stressful, but I try not to let it stress me out because it's, on, it's a competition with yourself. You, know, mm -hmm. you're, you are your biggest competition, your bad habits are your competition, not the people around you. So really trying to hone that muscle and just have a ton of fun. It, it keeps me in touch with my tools. It keeps me in touch with my intuition and uh, really opens me up to that, uh, that sort of quick production designer that I still have inside me mm -hmm. of um, you know, make this happen, make this happen, make this happen. I think that that's my internal pace yeah. is very, very fast. Yeah. Although I'm, a, I'm a, actually a baby sloth in a pair of footed <laughs> pajamas, as my portfolio would tell you. Um, I just, I really like to get things done and, and it fosters that I think in a healthy way, whereas I'm not trying to do that in my nine to five anymore. Mm -hmm. of how much can I get done? How much can I get done? I can sequester that into a weekend and go, all right, now you can have that mindset yeah. and it's healthy <laughs> and fun and you actually have output. Totally. I, it seems kind of aligned with one thing I've been talking a lot about is just uploading stuff to Instagram stories. For me, it has been this low pressure place for me to just do something creative, talk about being a creative, and it's quick, and it's done, and it's out, and I'm not judging it too hard, and I'll right. show up again and redo it and redo it and just give people a glance at my creative process, and that's the opportunity where I get to operate at that quick pace that I love so much. So I, I love the Battery Life Project. If I did it on my computer, I, I think I also have a 20, one of the ones that still has USB ports, yes. you know, and SD wow. card slots. So my battery just shuts, it, it'll just shut down, no warning. Oh so yeah, it's like, sorry, you're done. I better save often if I do the battery right. life Right, well with video then. editing, anything rendering is a little yeah, bit a little different. different. <laughs> yeah, I, I would have to keep it short and save often. Oh um, yeah. What are some of the other hobbies you have, whether they're creative or not? I know you keep a lot of things up in the air at once. So I'm interested in what some of those other hobbies are, but also, how do you juggle everything? Where do you put importance on things and how do you decide which kind of side project to keep up at what time? It's interesting. So I'm such a completionist, I tend to pick one and finish it, okay. which is great and relatively unheard of. Yeah. Um, but I, it's that it's that terrible focus and, and that really that responsibility. Responsibility is a huge core value of mine. Accountability and responsibility are two of my four. So um, it's not always fun having a drill sergeant in your brain, but <laughs> I do. Um, so I tend to get you know set on one thing, um, some of my favorite hobbies, I love to make costumes. Um, I'm actually working on a costume starting this week. I'm trying to get a dress form for it, but anyway. Um, I'm actually making a gown based on the Infinity Gauntlet. Wow. So I'm just gonna be like a giant Infinity. I was gonna do a Thanos thing, but then I saw, you know, anyway. Um, so I love to make costumes. Halloween's always a huge thing for me. I have at least two costumes every year. So right around summer is when I start to get antsy and, and create those. Um, I actually really love working with my hands, so I do a lot of woodworking. I made my dining room table, which is a lot of cool. fun. Um, I did like an industrial with the pipes and the, the raw wood and things like that. Um, and then that actually took me into, my mom is, is super hands-on and she, she came over last summer and we put together a wood floor in my she shed, which I <laughs> we were just talking about. Right. Um, so I have this wonderful garage in my backyard that we, we, my husband and I spent a whole summer redoing and half of it is woodworking, well, a third of it is woodworking, a third of it is brewing beer, and the other third is now split between a t-shirt making shop, mm -hmm. which is another one of my crazy hobbies, and a tap dance floor. 
So I decided the last year, it was sort of one of those bucket list slash midlife crisis things of, I've always wanted to learn to tap dance and I've never done it because I thought it was gonna be so hard and so expensive. Right. Tap shoes are $25 okay. and a tap lesson is $75. So you can afford it, mm -hmm. figure it out. Yep. And I went and I love it. It is really hard. That is the only part that was true. Mm -hmm. um, but it's so much fun and um, I'm working, my instructor really inspires me. She is a tap dance instructor. She's been doing tap for tw like you know, 20 years, but she's an epidemiologist full time. Wow. So she's, you know, studying the Zika virus and she's, you know, she's getting all of this research from Africa about Ebola and then ha has the ability to drop that and at 5.30 every night, go teach me how to, you know, heel toe, heel toe. And, <laughs> Um, seeing that separation, that mental separation, that's why I've always loved dance is that mm -hmm. I am a highly cerebral person. I'm always thinking in process. And if you don't pay attention in dance, you get run over. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. it's always been that great sort of physical activity that forces me to focus. And so I love that. Try to bring a little bit of it home with me with this new tap dance floor. So we'll see. That's amazing. <laughs> I, I'm a huge fan of people having hobbies outside of their profession mm -hmm. because I think it when you plateau at work and you can push a little bit further in your hobby, yeah. even if it's just for fun. For me, it's been hockey, skateboarding, rock climbing. Now I play with skill toys like kendamas, and it's just this. That's so impressive, by the way. I Thank love you. watching. I'll have this. to insert a clip for people that have no yes, idea what that it's is. So, so cool. Every time I go to Target, I look for one for you. Thank you. But I don't know what you have and don't have, so then I don't. I have, have them all at this point. So good. If good. you're not, if you're listening, check out the video version for some kendama clips. But I really think that. I've always maintained some hobby because it's this sort of cathartic thing where I can escape into it for a minute and push a little bit further or just do it for fun and escape that feeling of having to progress at all with some of these hobbies. And I just think it's so important that it, whether it's a creative hobby and you are creative or it's a not at all creative hobby. I mean, tap dancing obviously is very creative and um, also very physical, which I could get back into something like rock climbing or hockey and maybe uh, right. work out a little bit more, but uh, there's we all? total but total benefit to uh, just having a hobby. And I love that you have so many. You've made me a t-shirt. I've been in your quote unquote she shed as I think I maybe coined it. I don't know if you <laughs> call it that, but, and I've not seen you tap dance, but I've seen the floor and it's, it's something I aspire to have myself as a room, a space where I can just go and do. And there's yeah. not, a lot of setup or have to make it into the space. It's getting into that flow state is so much easier when you have the, the space Definitely. physically to go do it and also make the space mentally, emotionally to do those things. I think there's Absolutely. importance in, in space for both in your life. And I love that you keep it all up in the air somehow, but I admire the, the completion thing. I, I'm bad at that. <laughs> I'm reading a book. Um, called How to Start, and then there's a, a sequel to it, I think, that's like How to Finish, and nice. I need to get to the finish book, but I haven't <laughs> made it through the start book, and that's kind of the story. That's of an me. interesting paradox. It's of... very, very interesting, and the person that gifted it to me knew me well <laughs> to give that to me, for sure. Um, one thing I really want to get out of the show, especially when I have seasoned creatives like you in the chair, is what is kind of the home run piece of advice? That's a lot of pressure, I know, but what is a piece of advice you would give to an aspiring creative. I'm cautious on the show to not say a young creative because I think there's a lot of people that want to break in at any age Definitely. in their life. It's the suppressed creative. So what is the piece of advice you would give to an aspiring creative? I would say the number one piece of advice that I would give to any aspiring creative is that there is an, it is, it is an invaluable skill to know how to figure it out. And you don't always have to figure it out correctly. You don't always have to figure out the right answer because there's so much room in a supportive environment for asking questions. I can't pressure enough how important asking for help is and how difficult of a skill that is to mm -hmm. learn. But I would say 99% of my professional success has come down to the fact that I have been willing to try and figure it out. And that has come from me being stubborn sometimes and just wanting to be right and be perfect, which is not healthy. But it also has come from unsupportive environments, which unfortunately some people are in. And there is, it will bring you so much professional and personal growth if you are willing to trust yourself to be the best option. Um, I always tell people who are, I'll, I'll work with project managers who are just starting out or account managers that say, the client doesn't know and you don't know, what do we do? And I always tell them, then you get to decide because mm -hmm. you were put on this project for a reason. There's a reason that you talk to the client every day and not me, is that not only 
do you know more than I do? Even if you don't know everything, that's your chance to decide. And that courage to make that creative decision when you don't know and your boss doesn't know or you haven't asked yet, just the initiative alone is such an invaluable skill. And I think that that's, that's where people's trust in you comes from. That's where the trust in yourself comes mm -hmm. from. It's not always being right, but always being willing to try and figure it out. There it is. That's the piece of advice, guys. I so appreciate you talking to me and being on the show. Oh, that yeah. was such a good conversation. And I would love to talk Brene Brown and vulnerability <gasps> forever. All day. But I'm going to keep the episode a little short and sweet this time and let people kind of spin off and read your blog post. So Please plug, do, yeah. plug your website. Where, sure. where can people find that? So I'm at Amanda Cochran, C O C H R A N dot com. Uh, you'll see my logo is ARCD. I hope that's not confusing. Couldn't get ARCD.com. It's some sort of like architecture oh, guy. So plug them it. as well. <laughs> yeah, right. um, so I'm AR, uh, ARCD Atlanta. Um, I think it's ARCD underscore Atlanta on Instagram. Not updating that a ton. So check the blog. I post once a month. Um, having some new portfolio updates there as well. And then uh, you can follow my professional work at marketwake, W-A-K-E dot com. And then um, if you want to check out the CBD brand, it's called Reverie. Uh, on Instagram, we are at feelreverie and feelreverie.com. And right now we're doing promotions and stuff because it's, it's the launch and it really is. I've never really done anything for like CBD, mm -hmm. but um, it, it has been such a fun branding project and it's actually a really great product. So that's, that's my newest thing. And then I'll come back in a couple of months and tell you about my new project once it's on because awesome. I think you'll really be interested in Amazing. it. Amazing. Well, I can't wait. And in the meantime, in addition to the blog post, we both are highly going to recommend Brene Brown's work, however oh, you get yes. into it. I actually would recommend audiobooks mm -hmm. or listening to her TEDx talks. She herself claims she's a better speaker than writer. It's just mm -hmm. her natural style. So we'll plug Brene Brown's work at the end of this. And then Always. I got to plug myself, of course. This is another episode of The Creative Cup. We are now on YouTube if you want the video version, Spotify, and SoundCloud. Uh, SEO is not on my side right now. So if you search nickfish.tv, that's F-I-S-C-H dot TV. That's the best way to find the show until the creative cup search term climbs in SEO a little bit. So thanks for tuning in, guys. Like the show on all the platforms, and I'll see you in the next one.